How many are grateful that Jesus changes everything, as that last song said, right? Amen. Let me give it up for our worship team one time. Just amazing job. They'll get mad at me. They're not performing. Their hearts are incredible. They want to lead you somewhere. They want to lead us somewhere. We encounter God, and they do that so well. So if you, you see them, just high-five them. Thank them for using their gift in a way that brings you and us really to God. So it's just awesome, awesome, awesome. If you haven't figured it out yet, I'm not Pastor Derek. Um, again, Pastor Derek has more muscles than I have you know, area, whatever the scientific term is. I'm going to stop trying to talk smart because I just look stupid. <laughs> um, my name is Jason Gosselin. I'm part of the Dream Team here, and I am so excited to be able to bring part, you know, one of the parts of our Summer at Connect series. Just, just an exciting thing. But can we welcome our online viewers as well? Just give them a round of applause. We appreciate you being with us. Just super, super excited. Uh, Pastor Derek is actually, he's visiting with a church he's an overseer at, and I, just, I love that our pastor has a heart for the church, not just this church. Right, So many pastors get consumed by their four walls, their congregation, what's going on there, that they're even unaware of their community, never mind the fact that there's churches everywhere else. Like Jesus died for the church, not just this church, right? So I love that our pastor gets that. I love that he finds opportunities and pastors seek him out to be an overseer and just spend time with them and their team and encourage them, give them hope, share stories about what's working here, what's challenging here, and just really investing in the body of Christ. That's an awesome thing. That's where he is. He's not, he wanted to make sure you didn't think he was just on the beach somewhere wondering about looking for something to do or lifting heavy things or whatever. Although he's probably doing that in the middle of being an overseer at some point. I can't imagine watching him work out and thinking, why? Um, <laughs> at this point. But if you think of him, uh, pray for him. We'll actually pray for them now, right now. If we're grateful for Pastor and Stacy, let's pray for them together. Is that all right? God, thank you so much for Pastor Derek and Stacy. What an awesome example they are of just selfless love. First with their family and the way they raise their kids, but more importantly, God, the way they lead your church. They don't see this as an opportunity to leverage for workmanship. They see this as your workmanship. And they see it as an expression of a bigger body of Christ that rep is represented all over our country that desperately needs the local church. It's the hope of the world. So I pray that you would encourage our pastor and his wife right now Give them strength, encourage them, refresh their spirit, and help them just bring life to everyone they encounter because that's what people so desperately need is hope, encouragement, and life-giving. Help them do that. Bring them back safely next week. In Jesus' name, I never said a great big amen. He'll watch this online just to make sure I didn't mess anything up. Can you give him a round of applause? If you appreciate him, just give it up for him. Make sure he hears it. We love you, PD. He is so excited. I was catching up with him this week. He was so excited to be back next week. He can't wait to be back. Just, you listen to your pastor if you get a chance for him to talk about it. He sees a lot of churches that are in great situation. He sees a lot of churches that are struggling. And what it makes him appreciate is just the fact that our church is such a healthy expression of the body of, body of Christ. He just, he raves about Connect Community Church. So if you guys ever needed to be convinced that Pastor Derek isn't here because there was an opportunity he applied for, but because God has given him a supernatural love for this community, it's evident just in talking to him. He can't wait to be back. So I hope you guys are excited to have him back. Hit him up on Facebook. Send him a text, whatever you have to kind of let him know you miss him, but let him know. Um, and I'm just excited. I'm already distracted. Um, <laughs> not sure what I'm doing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we, just, we believe Sunday should be the best day of the week, right? Like if it's not the best day of the week, we're missing something. We're doing something wrong. And there's a lot of great things happening here in our church. Uh, August 24th, if you're part of our dream team, we got our team night coming up. It's not going to be a traditional huddle night. It's just going to be a party for you guys. Great food. Make sure you make plans to be here August 24th for our team night. Can't wait just to celebrate everything our dream team does. How many are grateful for our volunteer ministry? Just so many people doing so many things. If we remove those lime green shirts from the parking lot, it would be crazy out there, right? If we didn't have coffee, people would riot. It would be bad. There's so many things going on. But even just downstairs, our kids' church, how many know they're not just babysitters? Like, I love asking my daughter, who's three and a half, what she learned down in kids' church. And she's always got a story. And she loves Rose and Junior. Just loves Rose and Daddy, I wish you were more like Junior. Quiet. We're going back to church. You need to learn <laughs> that that's not okay to say. Right? But they're not just babysitters. They're planting seeds in your kids' lives. And I'm so grateful that I've got people down there that love kids, aren't just looking for something to do, but they're called to love kids. Activate youth ministry. Middle schoolers need an extension of Jesus more than anybody, right? You remember being in middle school? How awful was that, right? <laughs> no one likes being in middle school. Just waiting for it to be over. So you got Activate Youth Ministry, just loving kids, and I love that. As someone who ran Activate Youth Ministry for six years, youth ministry is awesome. 
all right? It makes a difference. I used to think about how miserable I was failing at it because I had Devin in my youth ministry, <laughs> right? It's off every week. <laughs> I have to be screwing this up. He's a pastor, he's a father, and I'm like, what's going on, right? But youth ministry works, and now I know that because I get to look at Devin. And he leads the 508, and he does, he's on fire for God. He's a husband who loves his wife. He's incredible. And not just because of his talent, but because God's gotten a hold of his heart. And I believe youth ministry played a role in that. We've got a high school ministry. Yeah, you can give it up for Activate Youth Ministry. We love them. <laughs> high school ministry, the change up, looking at Mike, knowing that he's got a heart for teenagers at high school because that was a season in his life that he wants to just help kids get through. I love that. Focused on high schoolers. Just awesome things, awesome volunteers just investing in the next generation. And then if you haven't heard of the 508, I'm not sure what's wrong with you at this point <laughs> because it's everywhere. They're everywhere. They're multiplying, and it's getting dangerous, really. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but Devin and the Young Adults Ministry, the five just had this past weekend their revival nights, just an incredible, incredible weekend. If you have an opportunity, ask him how it was because you want to see someone talk about what they're called to do, ask him to talk about the 508. And his team is incredible. He's got like 100 people that just serve the community and want to love the next generation. How many know that next generation is awesome when it gets a hold of it, if God gets a hold of it, right? Yeah. Just incredible, incredible. And I learn a lot from him, right? I learn a lot from Devin. The, the teacher has become the student, as it were. Like when I get dressed in the morning, I ask myself, is this something Devin would wear? <laughs> not his pants. I just, not his pants, right? I will never get on the skinny jeans train. And for that, you're welcome, right? You're welcome. Um, it's crazy. Mostly because I feel like, you know, I've got a three-year-old and a one-year-old. If Lilia ever gave me the eyes and we had a small window to be together, I wouldn't be able to get the stupid things off. <laughs> now that I think about it, I probably needed the skinny jeans before we had kid number two because it's overwhelming. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's too much. Too much. But how many know that's how you know you're old? When you look at what younger people are wearing and you go, oh, my God, thank goodness they love Jesus because their jeans are just so tight. <laughs> when I was a kid, it was the baggy jeans, right? When I grew up, it was baggy jeans. They couldn't be baggy enough. You could have fit like 17 people in one leg of my jeans. <laughs> if denim hit your leg, you needed new jeans. I actually blame my parents for Devin and the young people's skinny jeans because they've been praying for a long time that the kids would get tighter jeans. <laughs> the pendulum has to settle in the middle somewhere, but I asked Devin if I, no, I'm just kidding. I didn't ask Devin if I can make fun of him. I just did it, and um, I'm sure it'll come back to me, but I'm distracted, right? I get off, off course. How many of you guys love summer? Just having a great summer? Anybody having a good summer? My parents bought, they, now that the kids are all grown up, they bought a lake house on Lake Quinn Sigamond, and the last couple of years just renovated it, and it's just a great spot. A little beach for my kids, and my dad's got a pontoon boat. My mom has her little boat that doesn't go anywhere and no one else can touch. Um, <laughs> if you know my family, that's funny. Um, if you don't, it should be funny. But. So there's two there's boats, kids, barbecues, 4th of July fireworks. The whole neighborhood around the lake just shoots off fireworks. It doesn't even have to be 4th of July. It could be Tuesday at <laughs> noon, and they just fire them off. But we've got family coming over. We've got friends coming over. We've got my kids' friends, Lily's friends, my brother's friends. My sister, just awesome. Just great time barbecue outside in the summer. And what it got me thinking about is how much better life can be when you're around the right people when you're just surrounded by relationships that you value, that they value you, there's food, there's fun, you're laughing. It's just, it's almost, inv it's invigorating when you're around the right type of people. And what I thought about was the big idea for this message that I'm going to share with you today, right? I've entitled my message Fences, and we'll get into why, but I thought of your big idea, and I want to give you that, and then we're going to pray real fast. But the big idea for today, God has designed you and I to develop within the context of relationships. God has designed you and I to develop in the context of relationships. I just want to pray real fast and then we'll jump in. Uh, God, thank you so much for what I believe you've spoken to me and worked in me and now I believe you want to share through me. I pray that one person in this room today would leave here different, not because they heard a story or a, an illustration, but because you captured their heart. And as a result, they leave different and everything in their life is different because of you. And I look forward to hearing that story at some point in Jesus' name. And everyone said a great big amen. amen. So that's a big idea, right? God has designed you and I to develop within the context of relationships. And what I've learned is anytime God shows me something or I realize this is God's intention, I'm very aware that our reality is often very different from what he's intended. 
And here's what I mean. God intends for us to develop in the context of relationships. We love that. Barbecues, lake house, quinsig, fireworks, yay. But it doesn't always happen. Sometimes the reality of what God intends is very different because we've fallen in the trap at some point on our way to that destination. So while I believe God intends for you and I to develop and grow and be challenged and changed through relationship, the trap we all fall into, kind of the next thing in your, in your outline, is we allow offenses to distract us from those relationships and deter us from those relationships. We allow offenses or things that happen to take us from the very relationships God has intended to develop and change us into the person he's created us to be before we were ever here. And you think relationships, and I think of my dad, my dad, you know, me and God are good, and I don't need a bunch of people being around. And again, it's t- relationships are everywhere, and it's not on accident. Right? God's, God's intention. If you look at Adam and Eve, right? Adam was there and he gave Eve to Adam and said, you guys can compliment each other. You can tend the garden. You can be a helpmate. You can develop each other. That's an, it's a relationship. You look at what it says in Psalm 68, verse 6. It says, God sets the lonely within families. That scripture means a lot to me because that's what he did with me. It took me the time of my life where I was lonely and didn't know where I was and didn't have a lot of the right relationships and he placed me in this spiritual family. And not on accident, but that's what God wants to do. If this group of relationships isn't working, if it's hurting, he's going to place you within another family because it's his intention to develop and change you through relationships. Psalm 17, 17 says the same thing. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born to help in times of need. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. It's everywhere. You can't read this book and avoid the subject of relationships being intentional in our lives. And if you do, you're probably in the middle of a trap where an offense is deterring you and distracting you from those things. Whether it's marriage or parenting or coaching or teaching or someone you see daily, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's someone who walks by you every morning on the way to the train. I don't know what it is, but I don't think they're accidents. It can be distracting for you and I, though, when we get offended. Like I said, that trap. We allow offense to get in our way. And isn't it true? Like, anyone ever been offended? Yeah. Right? Just me? Good. This ought to go well for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> okay? It's almost offensive when I ask it, because of course we have. We're imperfect people. We're surrounded by imperfect people. We live in an imperfect world, and we're tired all the time. Right? You're going to be offended. Right? I've got a three-and-a-half-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old, and, and, and I've been married for nine years. I've, I'm a, I've been offended. I've offended those that are close to me. But I was thinking about my daughter. She's three-and-a-half. She's... She's basically personality with legs, like if you've ever interacted with her. She's just, she could do what I'm doing right now, and she would love it. Um, but she's, she offended me the other day. I'm driving her in a car. I had probably just bought her something, and I'm having this quality time with her, and she goes, Dad, I wish Mom was here instead of you. <laughs> right? Right? So I stopped the car. I put her car seat on the curb, and I left just to prove, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Why you'd even laugh at that? It makes me more concerned about you guys. <laughs> um, um, but no, in that moment, she's three, right? She just says things to kind of see what happens, right? But my heart hurt. Like, that offended me. I'm like, are you kidding me, kid? Like, really? And in that moment, I had to convince myself that giving her the silent treatment for the rest of our car ride was a bad parenting decision. But that's what I wanted to do. Like, are you serious? Like, it's hard. It's easy to get offended. Or my son, he's one and a half. It rarely offends anybody on purpose. <laughs> I'm trying to feed him, and I say feed as if there's any food being consumed. It's really just paper mache at this point. But I'm trying to get him to eat something. And he just grabs his tray, grabs all his food. It's like sweet potatoes that are overheated, so they're really mushy. right? And there's maple syrup, because everything's better with maple syrup. And he just takes fistfuls of food, and he just throws it at my face. And I'm offended, and I left the room. <laughs> He's in a chair, and I'm even buckled in because I'm a terrible father. And I leave the room, leave the room, like, to cool off. He could have fell. Who knows what could have happened? I had to leave the room for a second. It's crazy. He's one. He didn't do it on purpose. He's experimenting with his physical environment. <laughs> but I was offended. I'm like, I'm trying to nourish your body, you little brat. Eat, right? And that's what goes on in here, but it's because there's part of you that's offended. Or I think about with Lilia. We've been married nine years. Right? And every, every night we go to bed, the fitted sheet is askew. <laughs> right? Mallory hates it too, right? It's askew. Right? It's off the corner or it's like, it's like there's just extra sheet. And laying on extra sheet is miserable. 
It's uncomfortable. It makes every degree feel a little hotter. It's just, godly sheets should be taut. And every night I ask her, like, Lilia, I've asked you over and over again, like, fix the sheets. Can you get up? I have to fix the sheets. No, I'm asleep. No, now I'm going to tell you. Get out of bed. I have to fix the sheet. It has to be taught. But it offends me that she continues to forget. <laughs> it's okay. We've worked it out. You can judge all you want. We've, we're okay. <laughs> but they're trivial examples, right? Like, I'm kind of half kidding, and it's, it's, it makes you laugh. And we all have those things that we move past, and it's, it's not a big deal. But there's also things that we think about right now that we can't stop thinking about. Maybe there's more serious things where we get offended. Maybe it's a close relationship. Whatever it might be, there's been something going on in your mind that you're thinking about right now. You're like, yeah, this is all good. I'm sorry about your sheet. I wish your kid ate more food. And sorry about your daughter liking your, mom, his, your wife better. But there's a reality we all live in where we get offended. And the offense isn't trivial, especially not to us. It matters. But what I'm telling you is that offense can derail us from the relationship that God intends to develop us with. And in that moment of offense, for me to say, just move past it. Don't let it distract you from the intentions of God. You just want to punch me in the face. And I get that. But the reality that we experience doesn't change the intention that God's designed. And we've got to figure out a way to not fall in that trap so we don't miss out on the relationships that God has intended. Maybe someone's lied to you. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's someone in your family. Maybe someone's betrayed you. Maybe there's been adultery. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe someone's made a joke of you to someone else, a gossip, lie, slander, physical pain. I'm not sure what it is, but you're offended by some relationship you're in. And for me to sit here and say, let's move past that, is almost insulting and you're now offended by me. It is not my intention to offend anybody or minimize anybody's situation, but what I'm hoping is that at some point, the sediment in your heart can be shaken up a little bit and can become fertile soil that maybe God can do something with that I couldn't do. People ask me, are you excited to speak? And, and again, I don't get excited to speak. What I get excited about is the opportunity and the possibility that something I've struggled through, walked through, limped through can help somebody else. That's what matters. So that's what I'm hoping. So if I'm unintentionally offending you by minimizing your situation, please hear my heart and know that's not what I'm trying to do. There are real situations here that will take a while sometimes. I get that. I don't ever want to minimize that. But my prayer is that sediment will get, begin to be shaken up in the bottom of your heart and some seeds can get planted the rest of our time together today. That'll grow some fruit. So wherever you're at, I've been there. You treat people and relationships as disposable. Right? Nope, you said that, I'm done. Nope, you did that, I'm done. No, nope, you thought that, I'm done. You were with that person, we're done. And you treat people and relationships as disposable, almost like you can just block somebody on Facebook and it's done. That's my favorite commercial on TV with the old ladies that sit there and they're just like blocking their friends like it's all Facebook. It's not how any of this works. You've been blocked. <laughs> but it's so true, isn't it? That we as people can treat our relationships that way. Whether we block them verbally, physically, or just in our hearts, we've blocked them. And that relationship is now deterred and derailed from the intention God has for it because of offense. And it's a choice you and I make. Whatever it might be. We, we pull, I, coach, I coach basketball at Framingham High School. I've been with the program for like six years, and this upcoming season will be my first year as the varsity voice coach. Um, and I'm super excited about it for a lot of reasons, but they hear me say two things all the time. Two things I say to them all the time to the point where they probably just roll their eyes now. But I tell them to expect adversity because when you expect it, you begin to set yourself up to overcome it. When you expect adversity, you set yourself up to overcome it. So don't walk into a game and be surprised when a referee makes a bad call or you miss shot. Don't be surprised when stuff comes because then you're ready to move past it and do what's, what you need to do, right? The second thing they hear me say all the time is if something is challenging them, it has the potential to change them. If something's challenging you, it has the potential to change you. And it's basketball, and I get that it's trivial, but it's biblical. And it's the same for you and I. If, in this world, we will have troubles. Expect adversity. We can't be surprised when someone offends us. We can't be surprised when someone acts imperfectly. We can't be surprised when we're hurt. We should expect it. We're going to have troubles, but take heart for I have overcome the world. When we expect adversity, we begin to be ready to overcome it because of who's overcame it already. And we don't get consumed by our circumstances, but we've got to expect it. We can't be naive and think everything's going to go well. 
And if you're in the middle of a relationship that's challenging or in a scenario that's challenging you, it's because it has the potential to change you more into the likeness of Jesus. But you've got to do it. And I'm not saying challenging is fun. No one wakes up and goes, what's going to trip me up today? But be encouraged in the challenge that it has the potential to change you into the person God envisioned when he started knitting you together in your mother's womb. But you've got to not focus on the circumstance. You've got to not focus on the challenge. You've got to understand that there's a change on the other side of that thing if we can just stop being offended and move past it. Think about it. Think about a bridge. How many love going over bridges? How many hate going over bridges? Bridges are miserable, right? Scary. Relationships are like bridges. The more tension that is in a bridge, the better it is to go across. If I remove the tension from a bridge, ain't nobody getting over that thing. Relationships are the same way. We think that we want to remove all the tension and the conflict from a relationship, but if that's the case, no one's going to learn from it. No one's going to be able to take anything from that and get to where they need to go. But if your relationship can resolve tension and conflict, someone can take themselves from here over your relationship, learn in context of you, get to where God wants them to go because there's tension and conflict that's being navigated the right way. You've got to be a bridge that doesn't want to just minimize or neglect conflict. There's going to be some involved, and it allows people to pass over you and learn from you and get to where God's trying to take them in their life. But we miss that truth. Right? You and I miss that all the time. And if you're like me, you get encountered with things that when you're hurt, it only it yields two things. If someone hurts your feelings, it only it breeds forgiveness or offense. That's it. You can't half forgive somebody. Right? You're at about 63%. Doing good. <laughs> Eventually, you'll keep going. Right? You can't be half offended. You're either forgiven them or you're offended by them. That's it. And it's in those moments where you and I decide, are we going to be offended or are we going to have forgiveness? We go through this list of things that we evaluate the person. And it's not an exhaustive list. I put four things. You might have other things that you can think of, but here are the four I thought of, right? As we're evaluating, are we going to forgive or are we going to be offended? We think of closeness and depth of relationship. How close am I to this person? How deep is our relationship? And they make a mistake and I don't know them very well. Maybe I, I don't know them at all. I'm not offended by mistakes they make. I can grant them, peace be with you. I don't know you. Move on. But if I know them really well, they're like a a really close friend of mine, and they've been through some stuff with me, and they make that mistake, then it's hard for me to not be offended because you, you expect something different because you know them. Maybe the opposite is true. Maybe people you don't know you get offended by because people you know really well, you just grant grace. I'm not sure where you're at, but wherever you're at, it's only forgiveness or offense. And what I say sometimes, again, basketball analogy. If you're sick of basketball and kids' stories, I got nothing else. I'm sorry. But I tell my guys, you practice, the way you practice is the way you play. The way you practice is the way you play. And sometimes the little examples with the people you don't know, you can choose forgiveness or offense. You're choosing offense. You're practicing for serious matters later. And if it's easy for you to be offended by little things, it's going to be real easy to be offended by bigger things. So in the moments where it's easy, Someone cuts you off, someone says something snide, someone's listening. Practice grace and forgiveness. So when you get encountered with something that's a little more challenging, you're more prone to do it because you've been practicing for it. You've got to evaluate closeness of relationship and depth of relationship before you decide what's going on. But don't let that be a deciding factor. Decide to forgive, not be offended. Second thing, perceived intention. This one's big for me. If I think you did something on purpose, I'm offended. Willow, <laughs> so Willow does things on purpose now, right? So Jeremiah, is he trying to, he's got a little cup that doesn't let him spill stuff. He's got goldfish in it, and he just, he struggles, man. <laughs> just tries to mash his fist in there. He can't get anything out. He gets frustrated. Willow sees him doing this. She walks over to him, grabs the cup, takes all the goldfish out, gives him the cup back, walks away. <laughs> That's not an accident. That was intentional. <laughs> Jeremiah has every right to be offended. He's one. He just comes to me for more crackers. But in that instance, I think about us. If you perceive someone doing something intentional, I could never tell you not to be mad because they hurt you on purpose. So it's easy for us to get tripped up on, well, they did it intentionally, so I'm going to be offended, but we have to choose forgiveness. But you and I think, well, nope, they did it on purpose, I'm going to be offended. I do that all the time. Someone does something on purpose, I'm offended at you. I'm not going to forgive you until you intentionally come apologize the way you intentionally hurt my feelings. But we can't do that. We can't let perceived intention decide if we forgive or offended. Maybe it's frequency. 
Maybe someone continues to do the same thing over and over and over and over again, and it's getting tiresome offering forgiveness all the time. Maybe you've finally had enough and you're just offended. Jesus tells us we have to forgive people 70 times 7, just all the time, no matter how many times they do it. And that's one of the hardest things he'll ever ask us to do, short of dying on a cross, to forgive a repeat offender. But that's what he's asked us to do. Maybe it's expectations. In relationships, when you and I expect things to be, or be ideal, we create a ton of ordeals anytime something goes wrong. Right? Maybe it's expectations. Maybe they're not even communicated. But we have these expectations where people have to behave a certain way for us to not be offended. They're never going to meet that perfection all the time. So we're constantly going to be in this game where I'm offended until you do what I want you to do, never doing more than you need to, but just I'm in this place where I'm always offended. Forgiveness or offense, we have got to forgive, not offend. But you and I develop defense mechanisms, and maybe you're even like me, and you misapply Proverbs 4.23. I think I put this in your outline. It says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. One translation says, keep your heart. I used to say, no, no, I'm closing off to these people because I'm, I'm, I'm guarding my heart. No, I've, I've got a wall up to these people because I'm guarding my heart. But I did a study. Don't look at me funny. I study, I read, I do that stuff. right? And the word guard is keep in one of the translations. And if you look back at the original Hebrew, it's a word, not sar. N-A-T-S-A-R, not sar. And there's two kind of connotations to the word, one positive and one negative. And in this scripture, it's the positive one, which means keep, to tend, like you're keeping a garden. Keep watch. Let the good things in, take the bad things out. Pay attention to what's going on. And that's what the scripture is telling us to do when it comes to our heart. Make sure the good things are getting in. Make sure you're aware of what's going on. Keep it like a garden. Take the weeds out. Plant seed. Make sure everything's healthy there. But often, in the middle of offense, we, instead of keep the garden, we use the negative connotation, which is to conceal. We shut our heart off from everybody. Nothing's getting in. So we think we're guarding our heart, but we're really just closing it off to everyone. And if you read the second half of that verse, for out of it flows the wellsprings of life. If it's concealed, nothing's coming out either. Scripture doesn't tell you to conceal your heart. It says to guard your heart, to keep your heart, make sure you're aware of where you're at. But when we get offended, we conceal it and we take it away from people. And as a result, nothing comes out, nothing goes in, and eventually, we become so closed off that we can't even be in relationships, never mind developing them. We have defense mechanisms, right? I brought some props for everybody. I live in a world of baby gates because I've got young kids, right? But maybe this is a defense mechanism for you. Right? Watching my kids figure this out is fun. Right? Willow's got it down, but maybe this is a defense mechanism for you. Someone offends you, maybe it's sarcasm, like me. I'm a big fan of hiding a little bit of truth in a funny joke. <laughs> right, you needle somebody. Be sarcastic. Maybe you make a joke and everyone laughs, but you feel better because you insulted them a little bit because you're secretly offended. This is a little bit of a defense mechanism. Things can get past it, but it's concealing my heart a little bit. Does that make sense? It's not a serious one. It can be removed. It can be adjusted, but it's there, whether you know it or not. All right, sarcasm, humor, whatever it might be. Maybe it's a different one. Maybe it's you got to find an opportunity to tell your side of the story to somebody. Maybe you start gossiping and slandering the person. Right? So you're even more, more, more closed off. This one's more sturdy. Right? You're not getting through this. Reinforced. This is the next step. It could be gossip. It could be slander. It could be defacing their character. You're not maybe doing it to them, but you're doing it about them to other people. And what it's doing is it's building a wall in your heart. You're concealing your heart from that person by using something like this. Okay? But it doesn't stop there. It's not like you get a defense mechanism, don't just stop. They continue to develop whether we want them to or not. And eventually in relationship, you put up something like this. Right? We all see these PVC privacy fences, right? You can get versions of them with little space in between the, the panels so it's semi-private, but this is a privacy fence. <laughs> and you guys can't even see me at this point, right? But what happens is when I'm offended and it's a serious offense, I create an impossible barrier for that person to get through. My heart is not guarded, it's defended. It's not kept, it's concealed. And that person might not even know it's there because I'm not communicating it, I'm just putting it up. And therefore, the relationship that once was something God intended to develop me is now totally 
detoured. And I can offer nothing and they can offer nothing and there's no development happening. And it's one of those things we look at and think, well, is that really what I'm doing? Yeah. And sometimes the worst thing is we don't even communicate it. We just put it up. And then we react and we treat them a certain way because they're not getting past their barriers. And if we're not careful, we think we're putting up a defense, but we're really just trapping ourselves in a prison. And then what happens is we get mad at the people that can't scale the very wall we put in place to keep them out. And until we can break out of that prison, guys, the relationships that God has intended to develop us will never take root and change us. We'll end up in a prison wondering why everyone isn't pursuing us any longer and upset at them versus understanding that we've chosen offense versus forgiveness. And here's the deal. You and I think we're protecting our heart from something. But whatever we're protecting our heart from, that very thing, God wants to use that to prepare our heart for something. We think we're protecting our heart, but God wants to prepare it, and we block out the very thing that God wants to prepare our heart for because we think we're protecting it. And here's the thing. You and I get so confused as to who our enemy is. We think our enemy is people that we're in conflict with. We think our enemy is situations and circumstances. It's not that. Right? The people we're around aren't our enemy. They're imperfect just like you and I are. The circumstances we wish would go away are not our enemy. Sometimes we blame the devil for everything. Sometimes the crummy situation you and I are in is because we made a dumb choice because we had no advice because we're behind a fence. Stop giving the devil credit for things that we can fix. Here's who your enemy is, right? Here's what he's after. He's not after the people you're in a relationship with. He's not after your circumstances. He's after your mind. And the longer he can take residency here and mess with how you think and make you choose offense rather than forgiveness because they deserve it, they should have known better, they've been in a relationship a long time, the longer he can do that, the more he can put you behind that wall, the more he can take away the value you have for someone else. Because not just relationships you're in can add value to you, you can add value to those relationships. People are praying prayers right now that you are an answer to and you're stuck behind a privacy fence because you've chosen it. We have to choose forgiveness. When you and I are in that place, we have to ask ourselves, again, Romans 12, 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of our mind. God calls us victors all throughout his word, but we walk around like victims. We think life is happening to us, but God wants us to understand, as it says in Romans 8, 28, God is letting life happen for us. He can work together for the good in all things for those that love him and are called. Don't let this, the reality you see distract you from the intention God has. Don't keep falling into that trap. The relationship you're running from is the very one he wants you to add value to and will add value to you if you can step out from behind that fence and choose forgiveness. Psalm 51.10, I've got three things, I'm going to let you go. Psalm 51.10 says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. I know this isn't a quick fix. For those of you that are in that place, you've been there for years. Maybe it's a marriage that's had a fence in between it for years. It's not a quick fix. It's not a band-aid. I get that. It might be a process, but the process starts right here. Choosing to think about it differently. Allowing the sediment to be shaken up so a seed can be planted and you can see something different. So praying that prayer, create in me a new heart, O oh God. Renew my spirit. Because it's hard. Your heart has been concealed. Your spirit's been defeated. But we need to ask God to renew both of those things so that we can do what he's designed us to do in relationships. Here are three things that I believe God wants us to do. In those moments where you choose offense, God wants you to choose forgiveness. And here are three things you can begin to practice so when the moments come, you can do these things, right? First one, support, celebrate what God is doing in and for other people. Support and celebrate what God is doing in and for other people. Devin talked about this a couple weeks ago. The church needs to learn to celebrate better. It's so true. It's so easy for us to walk out of here and be aware of what we don't have, what we need, what we wish we had, what's challenging, what's struggling. Celebrate something. Every one of us sitting in this room has something to celebrate. It's just hard for us to see it sometime because we're consumed by the fence we've chosen. We've got to celebrate. Ephesians 1, 11, 12 says it this way, right? 11 through 12. Message translation. I'm reading a different one than you have in your outline. I apologize. But 
It says, long before we first heard of Jesus and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us. He had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose, he is working out in everything and everyone else. God's design for your life is to support, celebrate, and play a role in what he's doing in those around you. And if all of us took that mindset, we'd be helping everybody, serving everybody, loving everybody, doing what we can to help and support them and encourage them and bring them to where God wants them to be. And how great would the church look at that point? And you might be thinking, well, it's hard because of this and that and this and that. I get it. Last basketball analogy, I think. <laughs> I tell the guys, displaying the right body language in the wrong situation begins to prepare you to have the right mindset so you can overcome that situation. Displaying the right body language, instead of being defeated, instead of, instead of that, right? <laughs> this. Like, displaying the right body language in the wrong situation begins to train your mind to not look at the circumstance, but just do it the right way. And if we can, if we can get that, and instead of just, oh, it's just, that mindset can get us through so much if we can learn to just celebrate and support what God is doing in other people as a reflex because that's his plan for us anyway. Second thing, initiate reconciliation. I said, the first thing I said is how great is our worship team, right? Our worship team is incredible, super talented, but super humble, super great hearts. They do it for the right reasons. They're, they're great to be around. Do you want to know what's more moving to God than worship, initiating reconciliation. And you may think, well, why? Heaven's full of worship. They don't talk about reconciliation and revelation because they don't have to. We've been reconciled. What moves God's heart more than worship sets and lights and, and raised hands and worshiping in tears and moments is initiating reconciliation. That's not my opinion. It's a scripture that knocked me on my feet when I was preparing for this in Matthew chapter 5. It says, this is how I want you to conduct yourselves in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge that a friend has against you. Abandon your offering. Leave immediately. Go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then come back and work things out with God. Or say you're out on the street and an old enemy accosts you. Don't lose a minute. Make the first move. Make things right with him. In every conflict, someone has to be the bigger person. Why not us? Why not us? And you might be thinking, well, I've tried that. They don't forgive me or they won't forgive me. I've tried it. I've asked. They've done it. I've heard through people. They won't forgive me. It's not worth going to reconcile a great scripture, great point. Love that. Love worship. Love apologies. But I'm not going to do it because of this. Romans 12, 18 Do all that you can to live peaceably with all men. Not all apologies will be accepted, but that doesn't mean we don't initiate it. Every conflict is solved because someone chooses to be the bigger person, stops trying to be right and just decides to make a difference. Why not us? Why not us? And again, I know, right? Exhibit A, B, C, D. I know. But that reality can't distract you from the big idea that God has for you to develop in the context of that relationship. And that apology may not be accepted, and I get that. But if you initiate reconciliation, God begins to shake up sediment in your heart. And you begin to practice so you can play the right way later down the road. Jesus accepted rejection from a much bigger audience than he's asking you to. Initiate reconciliation. Don't let the determining factor and the result of what you think might happen decide for you if you'll do the right thing. I lied. I have one more basketball analogy. <laughs> There's teams in our conference that are going to beat us. It's just things you can't do. We've got a, a team in our conference that's got three Division I athletes, and they're just they're phenomenal, and they've been great for a long time. So for all intents and purposes, my guys don't enter the gym with the same mindset they do when they know they have a chance to win. But I look them in the eyes and I say, don't let the predetermined result of this interaction determine the fight that you display for the next 40 minutes. And what I want to say to you is do not let the predetermined result of an initiated reconciliation decide or determine whether you do it or not because your heart is capable of changing. And who you've been isn't who you have to be anymore. And no enemy, no lie, no other person's response to what you do can determine who you are. Don't 
Let a predetermined result decide what you do and how you do it because you're capable of more than you think. And then the last point, and then I'm going to let you go. We have to love others well. Book of Philippians, Paul's writing a letter to the church of Philippi, and he's just bragging on them, just encouragement after encouragement. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible. If you ever want to be encouraged, read Philippians. I'm so proud of you. You guys are doing great. I hear story after story of your faith and your works and your treatment of one another. How awesome. I think of you and I thank God. And then he says this. You'd think if anyone had arrived to where they didn't have to do any more, it might have been the church at Philippi. But then Paul says this. In, verse, in chapter 1, verse 9, he says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more. You and I will never get to a place where we've loved enough. My kids will never look at me and be like, Dad, easy on the encouragement. The homeless in our city will never look at us and say, that nah, it's enough warmth for the winter. The people that are going through divorce will never get enough of an arm around them saying, I'm so sorry you're going through this. The woman caught in adultery didn't get mad because Jesus didn't accuse her. You and I can always love people better and more. You don't have to drive 10 feet without seeing need. Right here in Ashland. Go a little bit further into where I live in Framingham. You'll see it all over the place. And there are people doing a lot of great things. And I think about how often I'm consumed with where I'm going and what I'm doing and what I'm missing. But I believe God is looking at us saying, connect, great job. I think of you and I am so grateful. You're doing so well. But my heart is that you would continue to love more and more. And not just the people in these four walls, because that's not what it's about. But the person that should be sitting there, the person that should be sitting there, the person that should be sitting there, the person that needs that seat, those people. We need to love more love more. And some of us are hiding behind a fence. And the very person that we need to love more might be the person that needs to get behind that fence. And we might need to initiate reconciliation and love others a little bit more than we are. Here's your final thought. And as I say, you guys can stand to your feet. The essence of Christian maturity isn't our invisible love for an invisible God, but should be our very visible love for those around us, which makes God visible to everyone. The essence of Christian maturity isn't our invisible love for an invisible God, but our very visible love for those around us, which makes God visible to everyone. You and I need to be doing things that give us the right to share a story. People might listen to your story before they'll ever sit in a seat. But the question is, are you doing things? Are you loving them well? Are you initiating reconciliation when they, when they offend you? Are you celebrating their wins? Are you liking their status anyway on Facebook, even though when you see their picture, you think of their shortcomings and how they've offended you? Are you liking it anyway? We want a chance to tell our story, and that's what needs to happen. So we've got to get out from behind our fences. Stop using defense mechanisms and get defensed so we can make a difference in our relationships. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes, let me pray for you before we go. I feel like there's two groups of folks I want to pray for. First one is really just, maybe you're aware that you're behind a fence. Maybe it's something trivial. Maybe it's a baby gate. And you can almost convince yourself it's not there because people can get through and you can kind of show them who you are, but, but it's there. It's there. Maybe it's a chain link fence that people can still see through and you might think, well, it's not a big deal. They deserved it. I know them a long time or they did it on purpose. Or quite honestly, I don't care. That, that's their offense. It's offen offensive. The fence is affecting that relationship in ways that you're probably blind to now, and they might not even know. Or maybe it's just gotten so bad that there's a PVC privacy fence that you can't even see past anymore, and you're starting to wonder why no one's pursuing you, but it's because they can't get past the barrier you put up. If that's you, and you've got fences, and I'm not saying this is gonna fix it, I'm not saying it's gonna go away, but you're aware that you need to make a decision to get out from behind the fence and start moving towards the plan God's had for you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you right where you're at. Yeah, all over the room. All over the room. Thank you so much. God, thank you so much for acknowledged need. Thank you so much that these people are aware of not just what I'm saying, but the fact that you might be saying something to them. 
There might be more to the relationship they have a fence in the middle of. Maybe, just maybe, they're in relationship because you want them to develop. You want the person to develop into someone else, into something you've called them to be, but they've allowed a fence to take root in their heart. They've allowed their minds to think a certain way, God. I thank you that they're aware of that now, but may they no longer just be aware of it. May they be disturbed by it to the point where they do something different. Maybe it's fill out a connection card. Maybe it's ask for prayer at the front. Maybe it's to bend a knee and ask you into their heart so they can live life differently. Whatever it may be, God, I pray there's a difference in them when they leave today because you've encountered them and they've encountered you and you've reached out to them in a way, as it says in Acts, that they may reach out to you and may find you in Jesus' name. And before I dismiss you again, every head bowed, every eye closed, maybe you're one of the people in here that's never put your life in the hands of Jesus. Maybe this whole thing is new to you. But maybe, just maybe, since I've started talking 30 minutes ago, you've been thinking and you've been hearing something, you've been sensing something that maybe there's more to the way life is right now. Maybe you're tired of fences. Maybe the fences have imprisoned you and you're tired of it. Maybe you're tired of always choosing to be offended, but want help choosing forgiveness. Let's embrace the one who forgave us while we were still sinners. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm gonna count to three, and if you haven't put your life in the hands of Jesus, but you want to today, and you wanna make him your savior, embrace him as your savior, and make him the Lord of your life, I just want, I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm gonna count to three, I want your hand to go up. We're all gonna pray with you, but we wanna know that that's you so we can celebrate with you. On the count of three, every head bowed, every eye closed. One, two, three. See that hand in the back. Anyone else? Don't miss that. Thank you. Church, will you pray with me? Pray with these people that have made that decision. Awesome, awesome, awesome. God, thank you so much. Everybody say it after me. God, thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus. I thank you that you forgive us. I thank you that he forgives me. Help me to follow your example and trust your ways all the days of my life. Help me to initiate reconciliation. Help me to support and celebrate those I'm in relationship with. And help me to love others well so that I can point them to you. In Jesus' name. Everyone said... Amen. Amen. Will you give it up for people that made that choice? Thank you so much.